Hey there, and welcome back to the Chinte Network podcast, where we explore the different stories and voices of our community. I'm your host, Siwa, and in this episode, I share a conversation with the passionate and elegant executive director of TMW Group of Companies and co founder of K Global, Ma Kain Te Luen. She's the woman behind the distribution of 10 international electronic brands such as Sony, LG, Sharp. And the retail business of Myanmar's first consumer electronics multi brand chain store, Wei Yuan Electronics. Join us as we discuss the rise of online sales in Myanmar, fashion as a passion, and the selflessness of motherhood. Hey everyone, my name is Kain, uh, Kain De Luen. I'm an ISON alum, class of 2007. I went to study in sunny California. And I finished with honors from Chapman University with a double major in management and marketing. Then I came back end of 2011 to Myanmar and I joined the family business. So, a couple of years later in 2016, I founded my own company with what I was very passionate about. And now I'm actively serving as the group executive director of my family business, TMW, and the co founder of my business, K Global.、Um, I'm very happily married and I'm a mom to a mischievous little one. <laughs> as long as I'm not at work, I'm spending time with her. So, yeah,、um, it drove us a little bit crazy, both my husband and I, for the, for, for the one or two months that she was going through terrible twos. But she's become a lot better now, so it's very manageable now. Yeah. That's, that's good to hear. When it comes to that balance, work life balance, how, how, do you, how do you balance that time? I think just really、um, bluntly, you get a lot less time with your friends and a lot less social time because I mostly concentrate on work and my family, my new family, my husband and my baby. So when I'm not at work, I'm with them. And when I'm not with them, I'm at work. So I cut down on a lot of social time. And actually, with COVID, it's Very manageable because of COVID. I don't really have anywhere to go. But、um, even before that, I've always had a habit of making sure that I had a work life balance. So even since I was young,、um, you know, I, I would try to get good grades. And、um, even in school, even in college, I always take early morning classes. I always try to finish all my school work out of the way. And then On weekends, I would go out with my friends. So I've always had this practice of、um, work and studies as well as fun or like family time. So it's quite manageable for me. It's, it's a habit for you then, where when it comes to time management. Yes. I feel like when you, when、yeah. you say you don't have so much of a social life, you, you simply mean with friends. Well, there's not,、um, we, don't, we can't really see each other, friends. So much right now, and also、uh, before there would be because you know, having the right connection and being in the good networks with people is important when you're doing business here. So, there are a lot of social events like、um, your uh, business um, shops, store openings, or like weddings, etc. Right? So, but because of COVID, there's none of that going on as well. So, it's given me a lot more time to spend with my family. We're still in that transition. I think that is part of the old to new generation transition. Yeah, definitely. And I mean,、um, you know,、uh, talking about business or talking about work, it's in our blood because this is how we grew up, right? Our dinner conversations since we were young growing up, because when we were young, also, like summer, during summer, my mom would just send us to my dad's office to just play around at the office, hoping that we'll catch on some, to something, we'll learn something even as we're playing around, you know, et cetera. So, I mean, Um, business, talking about business and work has always been our, in our blood. Essentially, it's always part of our dinner conversations. But because now we're busier with our lives and、uh, our schedules are just you know, different, it's, it has, it's also been hard for us to all come together as our families grow, also. Because my sister she has to make time for her two little kids as well, and her businesses, and for me as well, my own kid. and Um, all of that. So it's been really hard to come together and spend a lot of time together before COVID. But COVID's really <laughs> brought us、um, together to have more family time. Well, what kind of、yeah. challenges did you face when things started to change in the, in the business? Well, when it comes to you taking on more and more of the decision making responsibilities? 
I think、um, maybe I'll step back and talk a little bit more about when I first came back, how I transitioned into the family business and slowly entered. So actually, when I graduated, I was ready to study masters. So I did.、Uh, I took my GMAT. I was ready to go on to further studies. But it was around the time of Myanmar opening up, right, 2011, 2012. Then my dad、um, said, "Why don't you come here and do some work experience,、um, join the company family business for a couple of years, and then you can leave any time." And go back and study if you want. So、uh, when I first came back, I was just thinking, okay, maybe for a couple of years I'll join the family business and then I'd go back and study. But that do- that didn't happen because as I took on more and more responsibilities, it became harder to leave. So when I first moved back,、uh, my dad gave me、uh, a nice office and a desk, and he told me, okay, go manage this business, right? But I never stepped into that office until six months later. So the first six months, as soon as I came. Back and、um, I started working. Actually, I was actually working for our family business all throughout college as well. Both my sister and I. So whenever we get summer holidays or winter breaks, we come back. We just kind of do like an internship style. We just go to the office, learn whatever we need to, or like contribute in whatever little way that we can. So we've always been accustomed to the work and business that our parents were doing, or my dad was doing. So when I first came back, even though I had that little background, I didn't feel Qualified to go and run a business all by myself, you know. Even though he had given me a position or a nice office, so what I did was I just sat in his office. Right in front of him, like、um, he has a dining table, kind of like a small dining table inside his office room.、Um, so I just sit there every morning for six months, and I just try to listen to the conversations that he was having, to the way he was talking to our managers or how he was managing people, all of that. So all I did for the first six months when I came back was observe him, and he was so annoyed and he didn't understand. He was like anybody,、um, any child would be happy to have a nice office like yours and. Would be happy to have a title and go, you know, run a business that their parents give it and gift. And then I was like, no, I I don't know how to do it, right? Because、um, I have formal education, but it doesn't mean that I have work experience. So the first six months, that's all I did. And after six months, I realized I learned so much. I learned how to manage people better. I learned how to run things. Then I started running some of the businesses that our family business was doing. So when when it came to that personal growth, the learning process,、uh, being beside your dad, learning for those several months, did you realize something about the business world or about Myanmar's business ways that was completely foreign, new to you? Well, I learned that most of what makes you a great leader is just knowing how to manage people better and how to relate to people. So I think that's what I learned. That wasn't very surprising to me because I know that even my dad, having accomplished what he has, he hasn't had any formal training in business, but he's managed well so far. So I learned essentially that knowing how to manage people well and how to relate to people and how to get people to do things the way you want is one of the most important things that you can learn. I see. I see. Basically, what you also learned in school, which is which is management, right? Yeah. How is it? How is it like learning about it in theory and then coming back home and trying to implement what you what you learned? You know,、um, before I think we were kind of the first generation,、um, at least in my family, to study abroad or college and etc. So before we went off to college, a lot of my older relatives and everybody who were in business told us that whatever you learn in school is gonna going to be useless in Myanmar. I found that was not true at all because、um, I learned marketing and management, and it has contributed so much into the real life work that I've been able to contribute to my family. Because、um, the things that I mentioned earlier, like what I learned from my dad in the six months that I was just sitting inside his office, combined with what I've learned in a formal education sense. Has really come together to contribute to what I can accomplish at work. So definitely,、um, both things matter. Oh, okay, okay. Were there any times where your father had a conflict in the decision that the company needs to make? How did you work through that? So、uh, our companies、um, are. 
pretty well established. So we have uh, in our group of companies, we have a number of companies and we also have um, different business units where this has been, um, my dad has established this company for almost 30 years. So we have very professional teams running each business, right? So I can make use of that, means, meaning that I can have these people come on board with me if I have a new idea, you know, if I want to uh, accomplish something new. So that's how I went about it. And also, um, actually, it wasn't that difficult for me because um, my dad always says this. One, um, he has two kids, right? One looks like him and the other one acts like him. So my sister looks like him, but they are completely different in the way they talk, they act, everything. So, but I never my mom, but I actually act like him a lot. So we kind of work together well. And also for me, with the way that I was, you know, transitioning into work, I entered in a way that, okay, um, I don't know much, but I'll try my best to do what I can. And after I learned more, I knew more, then I started um, implementing things. So he really appreciated that I wasn't just like coming on and trying to change things, you know, right away. So that time really helped me come to terms with him. And he was very open minded about um, and welcoming of my ideas on how to implement new things in our company. Man, I wish I had that advice when, when I came back because uh, I, I was more of an idealist thinking that I could make a, a lot of difference, you know. But yeah. it really matters that you have a, a humble mindset because at the end of the day, our fathers have been doing business for decades and they have all this wealth of experience and business acumen that they can tap into. And they might not yeah. be able to share that. They're not, they're not teachers, right? So they're not going to be able to guide us the right way or the way we want them to. We have to put in the work to actually learn those lessons. And I think you're right that when it comes to getting their trust, you have to earn it. Respect is earned. It's not something that you just get because you think you deserve it. Yeah, and getting, I think, the other members, like top management in your company, um, people who have joined the company for many years, um, people who are a lot older than you, people who you knew since you were young, but still, when you come in now and share your ideas, they respect you because of the work you've done with them. I think that really helps because me taking that time and building that relationship with everybody, it really helped that whenever I had um, something new uh, to bring on board, everybody was aligned with me and everybody was just very supportive of whatever I was you know, intending to accomplish. I also feel like coming back, we definitely have to get used to how things are done in Myanmar when it comes to business, when it comes to making connections, how you need to rely on people. It's not so much uh, an issue of marketing, but more about who you know. Do you think that that is the case here in Myanmar? I do agree with that. It's very important, um, you know, having the right connections and um, it's a lot of businesses and a lot of deals are made based on relationships. So I do think it's very important, but I also think what's more important is, you know, your passion in what you do. For, for me, for example, when I started a, my own company, right? It's a completely new business and I ran it like a startup. So none of what I've accomplished in my family business matters when I started this company, right? Because I have to start it from scratch. Even I borrowed money from my parents. I didn't ask, I borrowed because I wanted to have this pressure to myself that I need to pay them back. I, you know, it doesn't come for free. I have to start from scratch, this kind of thing. So I think having the right connection is important here definitely in Myanmar, but also having passion is a lot more important. When you're doing a business, both your head and your heart are important, but heart is absolutely more important because having passion about what you do will help you get so far, go so far, and you will never think that, you know, you're working. And whenever you do business, shouldn't be about money or success. This is how I think. I think um, you should always think about how you can be of service to people. You know, can what you do bring joy to people and yourself? Uh, how can, you know, how can what you do make people's lives easier? If you can really establish that, I think money and success will follow. Having the right connection is important, but also I think having passion is definitely more important. And what is it that you're passionate about? So since I was young, mm -hmm. I like to dress up. So it was just a hobby, liking to dress up and looking pretty. So uh, my family business was trading distribution, right? Trading and distribution, retailing. But our 
core business was consumer electronics. We also have other businesses in service industries and hospitality management, real estate, etc. But our core business was consumer electronics. So I wanted to do something in fashion, which was completely unrelated to our family business. And I wanted to do it on my own. I wanted to challenge myself. But I knew that I didn't have any background in fashion. I didn't want my business to just be like a hobby or something that I had tried to accomplish and couldn't go further. So what I tried was I found a brand in Singapore which was going to franchise in Myanmar. So I did a fashion franchise and um, going into the business, all I thought to myself was if I learn anything, I'm happy. If I learned a few things at all, I'll be happy. It's not about how much money I would be making at the end of the year or anything like that. So I went into the business having this mindset and I wasn't even actually expecting it to take off so well and to be able to expand so quickly and to be where we are at right now but because of my passion i think it has really helped in getting so far mm. yeah when you were starting out a startup company you started with a franchise so it's actually a really cool way of learning about the business you're basically learning from someone who's been doing it to a point where they they can actually have other people sell their brand so you get to know all the ins and outs of how to run this business that you want to establish later on, maybe on your own. But if you're a franchisee of somebody's business, then you get to learn everything, uh, you know, starting from how the products are made to how to get these products into people's hands. Mm -hmm. Does it matter if the things are produced locally or overseas? Does the market even care? I, I'm, I'm just wondering as someone who has no idea what's going on in the Myanmar fashion industry. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think it matters where it's made, but uh, in the end, um, I think when it comes to fashion, it's not just fashion, but in any business, as I said, right? Can what you do be useful in people's lives? Can it bring joy to people? Can it make people's lives easier? I think that's, you know, what you need. Because even with this business, it's fashion, it's women's fashion. But why I wanted to choose this particular brand to franchise is because it's very affordable and it's very trendy. So those two things combined are a rare combination. If I can have a clothing brand that is very affordable and accessible to everybody and that women can keep themselves updated with the fashion trends um, at an affordable price, then I think I'm solving somebody's problem right mm -hmm. that's just the way i look at it so i don't think it matters where products are made but it's just about how can you solve somebody's problem that's true i feel there was definitely a lack of fashion choices options here in myanmar just a decade ago and now it's just everyone looks so unique so different from when i was a kid growing up i feel like all i saw was uh to main longji everyone was just wearing you know different patterns but the same outfit and now uh, we've definitely entered a more modern Myanmar. A lot of these young women are now uh, dressing up very Western. And I don't know how, yeah. how I feel about that. I kind of miss that rustic look that came along with, uh, you know, with our past. Um, even in, even from Myanmar where there are a lot of uh, more ready to wear, you know, before if you want a Myanmar outfit, you have to go to physically go to tailor and make yourself a Myanmar outfit. That's how the culture was. And that's because nothing was available, right? But now even there are uh, Myanmar labels, Myanmar fashion brands that you can just order online and get it. Now you can order online, huh? Yeah, you can. Everything can be done online. I actually yes. saw the other day a live sale where they have someone actually like I showing different items and, yeah. and selling it. Do you I do, do that? We do live sales every Wednesday, yeah. Do you actually do it yourself? Yeah, I participate in it. Wow, okay. Uh, can you share a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so I think um, Myanmar is at a digital leapfrog because nobody has PCs. Most people in Myanmar who use Facebook, I'm saying in a general population sense, yeah? So there are people in Myanmar who don't know that the internet exists outside of Facebook because they use Facebook for news, they use Facebook for anything. So there are people who don't know that the internet exists outside of Facebook in Myanmar in a general public sense. Everybody uses internet on their 
their phones. So also in terms of e-commerce and digitalization in Myanmar, when you say I sell online, it's people are basically saying they sell through Facebook. But Facebook was never meant to be a sales channel, right? No. Yeah, Facebook it was not built to sell things. It does not have the functions, the tools like, for example, Taobao. Have you ever tried Taobao? Yeah, I have. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that would be where but you could sell really things, right? And, and you could expect like a sale yeah. to happen. Yeah, Facebook was never meant to be a platform for sales, right? But in Myanmar, people, when they say that they sell online, they primarily mean that they're selling through Facebook. So this is um, how Myanmar is. It's because most people in Myanmar, they use their phones to access the internet and they use Facebook and they don't use anything else on the internet other than Facebook. So um, we realized that and we've been doing online sales via Facebook for a couple of years now. And because this is Myanmar, not surprised our Facebook sales are actually very good. For me, the next step is to have a proper e-commerce channel, e-commerce website to sell our goods. While we're establishing that, we still can't let go of Facebook because that's where the market is, right? The people you want, you want to sell to don't know how to come to your website, but you don't want to miss out those sales. So you still want to sell through Facebook, but you still want to bring these people, transition them and educate them to bring them onto the e-commerce website. And in Myanmar, there are also a lot of e-commerce marketplaces that you can work together with to sell your products. So during COVID, what we did was we started doing live sales. In through the live sales, it's kind of like a marketing channel as well as sales. So through the live sale, customers can see what new products are being launched each week. And they can just send us a comment if they see a particular product that they like. So we'll send them a link of our e-commerce website through Facebook to their comment and tell them that if you want to buy this product, you have to click this link and you'll get a discount. So that's how we run it is so in a way we are selling our products uh, we're marketing our products but also at the same time educating our consumers on how to use the e-commerce website oh i see ultimately everything stems from facebook do you actually also promote your customers or repeat customers to simply go to your e-commerce website and not go through facebook so whatever they see on our facebook they can buy on our e-commerce website but they will only get the discount if they buy it from our e-commerce website Oh, can they buy it from Facebook directly? I didn't think that that was possible. That's what everybody does. So 100% of businesses in Myanmar, when they, sell, when they say they sell online, they mean they're selling through Facebook. So what we've been doing for the past couple of years is selling through Facebook, manually just talking to each customer through the messenger and quoting them the prices, asking them their addresses, um, asking them to transfer money through messenger, you know, manually just doing everything through Facebook and selling through Facebook. Right. I find that to be a lot of logistics. You're going to have to deal with the... A lot of logistics, a lot of manpower involved, but that's how... that's what works in Myanmar for the time being. <laughs> yeah. So we're um, slowly but surely trying to build our uh, customer traffic to our e-commerce website as well as educating our customers on how to use it and how to slowly transition from just using Facebook to buy products to actually using e-commerce platforms to buy products, which is what is right anyways. In terms of sales, what kind of portion is the online sales compared to the retail sales? Um, it varies because pre-COVID, I would say most, not just my businesses, my business, but most businesses in Myanmar, if their online sales is doing very well, I think five to 10% of their total sales, right? Pre-COVID, I think that I would say that for most businesses in Myanmar. But during COVID, I would say that 50 to 70% of our wow. came from online. 50 to 70 percent that's a huge switch and and how do you feel about that change so after people are not afraid to go into the streets and go shopping again do you think that that number will bounce back or do you think people will get used to the online platform i think post covid is a long and slow process because we have to kind of forecast that this will not come soon it will come very slowly so even now i think myanmar is one of the few countries in the world where we are least affected 
by COVID, at least officially in the number of cases. And that contributes to people being more lax and, you know, slowly entering social life back again. So I think, um, you know, Myanmar is one of the least affected countries in that sense. But even then, I can see that our store sales, our mall sales are picking up but very slowly. And I think this process will go on very slowly. So I guess there's a silver lining because of COVID is that your businesses are forced to digitally transform and you're forced to sell online or adapt in ways that you can reach customers from afar. So I think this is also a good thing. And post COVID, uh, I would say that people have gotten a taste of how it is to shop online. I'm expecting uh, more online sales than compared to before COVID. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I want to go back to the shopping platform because you were saying how you actually get in front of the camera and you also sell the products, right? Eventually, you you yourself become a brand that people trust because it's you who's selling it. So I think it comes with trust because if I'm in front of the camera telling people I actually like the product, I'm actually wearing it and I'm showing it to them, it builds trust with my customers and people see that this is not just a product I'm selling, it's a product that I actually love and use and it actually looks great so it helps build trust with customers mm -hmm. and your customers i'm sure are buying these things because they follow you and they like the fashion sense that you have yeah i think so because it's important to always be genuine and as i mentioned you know passion is very important and it's not really about you know money or bottom line profits it's about being genuine being passionate about what you do so i think they also see that i'm very genuine about what I like, my fashion sense, what I wear, what I do. I always share where my family's at, as in like what we're doing, you know, things like that. So I think people do appreciate that. They must also appreciate that face-to-face -face interaction. Do you actually answer questions that customers ask online? Yes, definitely. Oh. And a lot of our customers, they actually tune in every week to watch the live and interact with us. All these things um, really help build a strong relationship and strong business. Because when I have a store opening, like if I have a new store opening, I meet so many of my customers like who'd line up in the morning um, before our store opens, you know, so that they can rush in and buy their favorite item of clothing before it runs out. And uh, whenever I have a conversation with them, like they try to take photos with me and they would just let me know how, you know, they're so happy to see that I'm very passionate about this and um, they get to see me and they get to interact with me. How's that like, like becoming a fashion idol for young Myanmar women? That, that... <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a young uh, fashion idol for young women, um, but I don't know. For me, it's natural. I think it's the natural thing to do because I'm not, um, you know, dressing up in this way or that way, or I'm not doing these things to put up a front, right? I'm doing these because I'm passionate about it. I like to dress up. I like to take photos, you know, things like this. So people can just relate to that, and it's it's very natural for me, actually. Oh, okay. Was it easy to get online and actually talk to customers and be more public with your passion? Because it's a different thing, right? Like like working the business from behind the scenes, being in the, the meetings, right? Compared to getting on a camera and interacting with your customers. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I get where you're coming from because I also thought hard about this before uh, stepping into the light because for me, I'm a business person. Right? I've always been about being a business head behind my businesses. So I shouldn't be the one to be in front of the camera and modeling for the products when I'm the business person behind the products. So I thought about this before I actually did it. And if it was a business like my family business, where things are being run in a large scale professional manner, I don't think I would be in front of the camera selling the products. But because this new business and company that I founded is more, I run it more like a startup. We have a very lean human resources. Everybody in our company is young. Everybody is passionate about what they do. So for example, my digital, digital marketing team, we have people who haven't even graduated college and they're here and they're always contributing new ideas. And we run it in that way. So our customers also know that everything we put out is what we actually 
feel and like and is our genuine self, right? So then I made a decision where I was like, our customers already know that and relate to that. So I tried, I tested it out. The first few lives, I wasn't a part of it. I was just behind the camera directing. And then the first live that I was on, I found that customers really appreciated it and connected with us, they were able to ask me styling advice or they were able to ask me product related questions and my answers really helped them. So I found that it, it's helpful for us as well as customers. So that's why I made a decision to continue. Uh, okay. Was it comfortable for you though? Or was that difficult? I, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult because even with my family business, I would have a lot of public appearances and I would have to meet, um, let's say, because we have sub distributors all over the country and dealers from around the countries. So I would have to host events where I give speeches at events with over 500 people or 700 people. So it wasn't difficult for me. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I mean, is there anything you're trying to learn right now? I mean, given the COVID-19 situation, I'm assuming there's a little more time to spare. And so how do you spend that time? Actually, I, I don't find that I have any extra time even with COVID go going on. Really? Uh, yeah, because uh, as I said, some of the time that, that, you know, we didn't have before, we're having family time and other times we're doing live sales. We're just full on launching online platforms for my family business as well as my own company. So we're doing uh, e-commerce websites for uh, consumer electronics as well as fashion. So I don't really find that I have that much extra time at, at all. But I would say in terms of personal growth, I think what impacted me most in maybe recent years is I think becoming a mother because the rest of the stuff, I've been going through it for most of my life, even working and being in the family business or starting my business, I've always been geared up to going in this direction, right? Since I was young. So I, I would always try to accomplish everything I want in my professional life before I start a family. But things don't always come the way you expect them to. So but we got our baby and when I became a mom, I was just nothing I prepared for or nothing I expected turned out the way I wanted it to be. So I, I didn't know how, like I, I didn't know if I was prepared to be a mom. I didn't know if I was uh, wise enough to be a parent, you know, none of that. But every day I'm doing the best I can and I think I'm doing okay now. So I think um, in terms of growth in the past couple of years, um, I would say becoming a mom is the most impactful one. Oh, okay. Becoming a mom. I unfortunately will never get to go through that. <laughs> so, parents, you will. Um, becoming a dad, yes, but becoming a mom, that's, I don't think that's the same thing. When you say it was the biggest change for you yeah. to go through, uh, what, what exactly did you learn from that process? Is it just that uh, you can plan all you want, but at the end of the day, nothing will go as planned? That's one of them, but I think maybe the biggest thing I learned is you actually learned and you actually feel and you actually know what it is when you say, you know, being selfless. If you say you know how to be selfless or, you know, you're not a selfish person, it's not the same thing. Because uh, when I became a mom, I found that as a parent, the feeling and the love you have for your child and wanting to provide for your child and just wanting to make sure that this little thing um, is happy and, you know, healthily alive is the most important accomplishment that you think you can accomplish you just become selfless you just want to do the best for this little human being um even let's say for example if i'm breastfeeding and it didn't come it was very hard for me but i always wanted to provide the best for my child so even though i i was like i felt like i was bleeding i i just continued and wanted her to have mom's milk this kind of situation. So I'm saying just in everything that I was doing after becoming a mom, I was putting the baby first. I was always thinking about the baby before myself or anyone else. So I think I learned how to be selfless after becoming a parent. Wow, okay. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's a very noble, that's a very noble lesson. You don't really know what selflessness is until you become a parent. But then how do you take care of your child's growth? How do you make sure that she is getting 
everything that she needs and not wants but needs like how do you tread the line between educating and spoiling your your child your baby i think uh, only after becoming a parent you know i realized that every parent try to do the best they can for their child with whatever resources they have right so i think um Maybe the way how our parents, my parents raised us, I think I would try to impart the same kind of values in my child's life. And I think that, you know, tough love is very important. My, my parents raised us in that way. We had to earn everything that we wanted, even though, um, you know, they could provide it easily. So this, I think this is the way that I think I will raise my child, always try to be balanced and have tough love um, when it's needed. And I think the gift of education is very important so that, you know, they can lead their lives independent, independently um, when they grow up. Oh, when it comes to that, well, what's your opinion about the education in Myanmar? Uh, would you think that your daughter would join schooling here? Or would you rather her be somewhere a little more developed? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? And, and also, would you would like her to learn Myanmar before she goes into an international school setting? Because we're deeply rooted here, I think I would just raise my children here until they go off to college uh, abroad. And um, in terms of language and culture, I think uh, for me, I grew up here, you know, and I only went to college in the States later on in life. But even then, we're th third cultured kids, right? Uh, being in an in international school. So I think um, I, I think my children would be similar. Um, I would uh, have them go to uh, international school as well but um, as you mentioned I think language is very important especially Myanmar language if they're living here in Myanmar so I would uh, make sure that even if they went to an international school all their lives I would make sure that you know they can read and write and be articulate in Myanmar as much as at least as much as I am because I think it's very important your culture and your upbringing is very important and also the people who you surround yourself with. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. I mean, that is the main reason why uh, our parents chose to put us in ISY because they knew that in ISY would be exposed to a very diverse community, right? Not just in race and, and ethnicity, but also in thought and ideas. And I think yeah. that's also a very a pivotal integral part of a person's development because if you only are exposed to the same kind of thinking or the same people doing the same thing then you're not going to be able to start something of your own you're not going to have a new idea it, it will all be uh, planned out for you yeah exactly that's why i think um you know when i say education it's not just formal school education it's uh, the people you surround yourselves with the values you learn in life all of this then I, I'll just ask it bluntly, would you be sending your child to ISY once she's of age? Or are you considering all these other international schools that are popping up? I mean, ISY has competition now. There, there are a lot of uh, other nice schools. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, so I've heard there are a couple of other schools as well. I think as a parent, I will always do due diligence and I will go to all the other uh, schools and still explore. But I mean, we live three minutes away from ISY and my nieces go to ISY. So ISY just seems natural to us. That's good news for ISY, I guess. Hopefully if anyone in ISY is hearing, like a couple of years later, yeah. they'll have a new addition. Yeah, I think who I am as a person is shaped by, um, like you said, the people surrounding us, uh, the new ideas we get from the people around us and all of that. So I think for me, ISY and the people from ISY, my friends, I feel like they're my closest people, my family. And that's why I really like, I always try to support the Chinde Network and I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing to bring people uh, together. And it's because I meet a lot of people from everywhere now that I'm older, I realize that, for example, my husband went to uh, Myanmar school, right? So they had maybe like 70 to 200 kids in each grade. And he has a good support system and close-knit friends, but they always had choices, right, growing up. If they don't want to be friends with this person, then they can find another friend out of the other 200 kids, right? But in ISY, um, the way we grew up is like, even if you, if you, even if you don't like this person, there's just 20 of you in each grade, you know? So you're forced to love these people. You're forced to 
learn your differences amongst each other and you just become really close knit and you just become like the closest people as you grow up you know so i really value these relationships and i think that's very important i feel like uh everyone who i talk to seems to be going through something similar when they go to college they still stay in touch with their friends from isy from high school from middle school from their childhood and in terms of my friends in the states they they would always find a um, a time to meet up whether it be thanksgiving or christmas they'll they'll come together and just have dinner together and just spend some time catching up that's not something that i feel a lot of people have the privilege and the pleasure of enjoying you know so and uh, what i uh, you know for my uh, graduating class uh, we have a lot of us are married and most of us have children i mean even um we even if it is hard for us to meet up as often i have friends from my class who are also in the us you know still working there living them living there even if i haven't seen them for years if i just see them again like and sit down with them for 5 minutes it's like all goes back to our deep friendship of many years we're still as obnoxious as we were before And that was Ma Kainte Luen, executive director of TMW Group of Companies and co-founder of K Global. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Chinta Network podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a thumbs up, leave a comment below, or send a message to Chinta Network at gmail.com. I'm Siwa, and you're listening to the Chinta Network podcast. <laughs>